Hello and welcome to tonight's session. My name is Bo Manry. My business partner, Chris Goff, will be joining us shortly. Just about every week, Chris and I get to host this live Q&A session for our REI Pro members. And it's such an awesome benefit to being an REI Pro member. Now, each week, our members email us in questions that we have, whether or not to how to use the feature of REI Pro or how to work the numbers on a current deal they may have, or simply just an educational question. But being part of this will help you stand out and get the answers that you really need to succeed in this business. Now, another benefit to attending this live uh, session is that you get a chance to ask your questions live at the end. So go ahead and open up that Q&A panel so that you're ready to type in your question at any time during the first part while we're answering what our members have sent in this week. It's all about education, so welcome to tonight's live Q&A. All right, let's go ahead and bring in Chris Goff. Uh, welcome, Chris. Hey, how's it going, everyone? And uh, thank you so much for for joining us. Um, we've got a lot of great questions today to go over with you. And I don't know, it just seems like it's it just gets better every single time we do this, and that's really just a big shout out to all of you that participate and uh, join these meetings and learn. I think that's really the what separates everybody is just really the knowledge. So uh, congratulations on being here and being a part of this. Um, we're going to try to make it as educational as possible through here. And I did make one promise to everybody, Bo, if they haven't already, um, we're going to Give you access to one of our best-selling books um, that we did with Larry King. So uh, we're going to show you how to get access to that if you haven't already downloaded it. And the simple reason is I know a lot of people have, but uh, many people probably don't know. But I do run and own numerous meetup clubs across the country, and uh, we did invite those members to participate as well for this evening. So. Um, just ready to rock and roll and let's get this party started. All right, let's get this thing started. Um, real quick, before we get started, I wanted to go ahead and show a few things here. Um, you know, there's people out here in there doing it and they're putting their heart into it and they're making a ton of money doing it. Uh, this is Jonathan Dunn. I believe this was his first deal, wasn't it, Chris? $5,000 profit? Yeah, I believe this uh, was a wholesale deal. Um, that he made five grand on that he was backing it up with another deal. So, you know, that's always good to get these testimonials in of people saying, Hey, I actually did it. Yep, you know, cause so people. many, so many people talk about it, but how many people go out there and make things happen And Jonathan and many others um, have. Yep. Here's another one. Kenneth Barney, $5,000 profit. Yeah. This one was actually cool because if you guys have seen my how to wholesale a pre foreclosure training video, I mean, I think we have over a half a million views on that video. He wholesaled a property that was in pre foreclosure and, uh, you know, made five grand for just passing the deal on to somebody else. How about Steve Gordon? Here he is $10,000 per month profit. I remember when this deal happened. This was an awesome deal. Yeah, there's a picture of both of us there. And um, so this was this year, by the way, this was not something, you know, that happened 20 years ago. This deal, this house that you see in the background, this very small house is probably about a block away from the beach. And Steve went in and seller financed the house and then turned it into an Airbnb, which is awesome. And uh, anytime you can net 10 grand per month in profit, um, that's a pretty good deal. You know, how many of those do you need to do a year to replace your current income? That's how I look at it, right? <laughs> exactly. Not many for most. <laughs> and here's Nanette, $47,000 profit on her first deal. Yeah, this was a fix and flip. And again, this was a fairly small home. Um, it was an elderly couple that uh, wanted to sell. And um, she did a very good job on this property. And, uh, you know, in, when you do a deal, whether it be your first deal or your 20th deal, Bo, it just booms confidence. Like, and it almost seems like it's easier to do the next deal when you get through that one or through that next one. Um, there's just something to it. 
uh, that just builds confidence when you get these deals done. Well, you know, when you get that first deal done, you realize that you can actually do it and that it's a rinse and repeat. So you're really working hard at trying to figure it all out to get that first one done. Yep. Roy Turner, $134,717 profit. Yeah, I like showing this one because <laughs> this was his first deal. And this was a beautiful home in Houston, Texas. I mean, just a stunning custom built house. And what happened was the owners just built the house. <clears throat> and I don't know if you guys remember all the flooding in Houston when that, that all that happened. Well, this house got flooded and Roy went in and bought it at a awesome price and then fixed this property up, turned around and resold it. I mean, 134 grand on one deal. That's what I love about real estate. It's hitting that home run deal. Um, and and it, it doesn't happen every day, but it happens. And you just got to put yourself out there to make it happen. And that's what I love about, you know, real estate. It just never gets old, ever. No, and you know, and, and we really appreciate all these people sending these in because we could sit here all night long and just go through the testimonials that have been sent in. So just want to share that with a few, let you guys know that's really working on that first deal. There's people out there doing it and you should be too. All right, you ready to rock and roll? Yep, let's do it. All right, first question coming from Jose. It's a general question. Do owners of properties who may be in pre-foreclosure or who have properties, they just want to perhaps sell, usually get bombarded with other investors trying to market to them? And if so, how can I stand out from the rest? I assume calling them would be better than marketing to them, such as postcards or maybe both. I'm also thinking of doing some kind of marketing where the sellers and the buyers come to me instead of me going to them. Yeah, so hey, Jose, and uh, thank you for submitting this question. I just want to make it clear to everybody that, number one, you don't really have a lot of competition in this particular part of real estate, meaning the pre-foreclosure side, because honestly, there's not that many investors that know how to connect the dots and put the pieces together. So don't feel that, you know, people are getting bombarded with marketing things. Um, but for me personally, you know, when I market these people, I do use both postcards and letters. But what I wanted to do is give you one really good tip on anytime you're marketing pre foreclosures. Okay. And I think this is going to help separate those that are listening to this and those that aren't. And because it works. <laughs> so what I would recommend doing is handwriting a very short letter. Okay. Hi, my name is Jose. Um, I'm a local investor looking to purchase properties. Just keep it very short, almost general. And then what I want you to do is take that letter and I want you to put it in a USPS priority envelope. So, right, it's going to cost you a few dollars to get that done, right? But when you look at the return on investment, that's what I would want to look at. You keep doing that over and over again. You're going to see better results because I want you to think about if you get, you know, just typical mail, usually we sort our mail over the trash, right? And that's why I like a postcard versus a letter where a letter I like because it's more personal. And when you put that inside of a big priority envelope, it's almost a guarantee that the owner is going to open it. And that's what I love about it. It's like you took the time, not only spent some money, but took the time to do that. Um, you might actually start building trust a little bit faster. So I would highly recommend using a USPS priority envelope. And I get it. You can't do it for a thousand, you know, pre foreclosures, you know, pick out maybe the ones that look like a little bit better deal. You know, maybe it's a little bit closer to your home and so forth. So I want you to try that and I uh, hope that works for you like it works for us. Awesome. That's a great tip there. All right, next question from Jonathan. General question. Hey, guys, can you quickly review the steps for working a deal? You call them the executable steps. Thanks a bunch. Yeah, big question, um, Bo, if you wouldn't mind, just I want to show people. You know, I'm going to tell you about it, but I want to show you because to me, to me, this is the most valuable part of REI Pro. 
And uh, Bo, if you wouldn't mind jumping, it really doesn't matter what property it is. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to figure out my uh, thing here for Google here to pop up. One second here. If you can, I will. But oh, no, uh, while go. you're doing that, um, I want to tell people where this came from because people that follow me, they hear it all the time, like executable steps. What the heck does that mean, right? So I was actually doing a live event training event in, um, I believe it was San Diego, uh, California. And um, I started to write down the physical things that we do as investors in an in a order that we would normally do it. So I started to write all these, what I call physical steps down, not just the theory behind, but what physically do I have to do? And unknowingly, um, I really just unlocked, I would say one of the biggest missing pieces in real estate education. And that was, what do I do? When do I do it? Right? And I put it in a very specific order when I did it. And people started to go, oh, well, that makes sense now. Because what does everybody fear? It's what do I do next, right? So we could say all day, hey, go find a deal. And there's a lot of ways to do that. But now what? Well, you got to talk to the owner. Yeah, I know. But what do I say? Okay, but yeah, but how do I know if it's a good deal or not? And you start questioning the next step. And that usually you know, is the make or break point of you doing a deal or not doing a deal. And it, I want to, I know you guys can't see this very well, but it, this is what I originally came up with. And then I, of course, typed it up. And what I did was, Bo, is I took every strategy. So this would be like wholesaling, you know, retailing, mm -hmm. you know, all the strategies that I teach. But the cool part was like, you know, when you get to step one, okay, locate a deal. Okay. There's a lot of ways to do that. And then it tells you, okay, now what? Uh, we need to contact the owner. Okay. There's multiple ways to market or contact or call uh, the owner. And then it says here, if the property doesn't need a lot of work, maybe go over to this strategy over here, because maybe it's not really a wholesale deal that you can get at a discount price. So I put all these steps together. When I started teaching this years ago, I called it the executable steps because it was like, you have to do it, physically do it. And this was the very first thing that we pretty much put into REI Pro. Yep. And um, because I always said to Bo, I was like, you know, if people don't understand what to do next, all of these other things really don't matter. Because you don't know what to do. You could have all the coolest tools on the, on the planet and not know what to do next. And still, you're not going to do a deal. So when you pull up a property, you're going to, if you just scroll down there, Bo, you're going to see step one. So these are what I call the executable steps. And obviously, you already found a deal. We're just, you know, what I call the due diligence is give me the basic facts about the property. You know, who owns it? you know, square footage, all that good stuff. Um, obviously, we have tax info, mortgage uh, information, any kind of transactional history and any custom fields, but it's really kind of doing your due diligence, right? So we found a property. Doesn't matter if you're driving, you found the property or somebody went to your website, filled out a form. What we're saying is we're working this property. Now, once I have this property, look, you move to step two. It's pretty simple. Okay, I need to talk to somebody about this property. Hopefully it'd be the owner, but uh, sometimes it might be a realtor. Sometimes it could be the management company. What do I say? Well, you go to the phone scripts and you're going to have those phone scripts there. Also have the ability to create your own custom phone scripts. Mm -hmm. My job in step two is to what you hear all the time, qualifying the seller. Are they motivated? Are they open to terms? Um, you know, are they just fishing around to see how much they're going to get? You are literally qualifying the seller from this point. Now, if this goes good and, hey, we need to go look at the property, you just simply move to step number three, which is going to be that property inspection. And here 
is where, hey, I need to go into the property and not only build the relationship with the owner, but you need to figure out what's wrong with the house. You need to calculate the cost of repairs um, for this house. And then I'm going to enter all that information. Okay, now that I have that, well, what do we do now? We'll just go to step four because now we need to make an offer. The offer is accepted. You'll move to step five, which is putting it under contract. And hopefully you guys are catching on right now because what's happening is we are literally holding your hand through the process. Yeah, there's some little things throughout each you know, step here, but at the end of the day, you just have to follow this and it will walk you through the entire process all the way to step 10, which is payday, which is you know the fun day. So I hope that kind of helps. So when you hear me say executable steps, it's something I kind of coined years ago. And it amazes me how many people have almost kind of robbed me of this concept. I could hear yeah, there, there's other videos out there that's like, oh, now they're going through a step by step. It really does make sense, especially if you're new. Now, if you've been in the business for a while, you already understand how to get through to the next step. It's not something you physically, you know, think about. But from somebody just coming into real estate, this is a home run. Um, it, it, I've never, I don't think I've ever actually taught one thing that would impress me more than this concept that I developed years ago. Yeah, but Chris, you know, as many deals as you've done and I've done, we may not consciously think about these steps in a step-by-step -step fashion, but we go through every single one of these steps in this order to make the deal happen. So it truly is kind of a GPS of real estate investing right here. Yeah, that's funny you say that because that's what we called it back in the day. I, it, was, it was so funny when I, when I held up this chart and I started teaching people this in a live event, somebody in the audience called, oh my gosh, that's like the GPS of real estate. And I'm like, well, yeah, I guess it kind of is. There was another story where, you know, we have like, you know, I think there was like a hundred people in the room and I had this chart and I just started to show everyone, this is what I'm going to teach you all weekend. And we took a break, Bo, and I sat it down on the little table that we'd have the projector and all that good stuff. And I started heading to, you know, the restroom and our, we had staff in the back and, and this guy in a wheelchair started slowly just going up the aisle <laughs> all the way to this little table. And then next thing, you know, cause one of my staff members <laughs> watched him do it. He had a jacket on and he pulled the chart and he was like <laughs> in his jacket. And he was like, Zing, right down the middle of that. The, of course, the staff member was like, oh, hold on to a second. Hold on a second. You can't take that. He's he like, I that. know, but this is what's going to help me. You know, he was so frustrated that he couldn't take that piece home. But that's what I was teaching everyone for the weekend. So to me, this is the bread and butter. It helps you. It eliminates the crap, the confusion of how to connect the dots in this business and, uh, so I'm super proud of this one thing that, uh, you know, I came up with years ago. Awesome. Switch back over here now. All right. Ready for the next question. Let's see here. Coming from Susan. It's a general question. I found a property while driving for dollars. I called the owner he said that he filed bankruptcy and the bankruptcy has been completed for some time or some time ago. So he has no further info for me. It's still vacant. So what is my next step? Uh, good question, Susan, but really there's not a whole lot you can do until you find out who owns this property since the bankruptcy has already been accepted. Now, most likely the bank already has it or is in the process of taking it back. But until they put it back up for sale, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. Um, you know, when we're doing a property, Chris, where you're thinking about all these things we can do with the property, right? We ask ourselves these questions like, what well, can I wholesale the property or could I sell or finance the property? Could I lease option the property? All these things we want to do with this. But in, in all these questions, really in this situation, you know, the answer is no, because the bankruptcy has already been accepted. This 
original owner can't do anything to help you with it. So you need to find out who owns the property, uh, Susan, and it's probably going to be the bank. And that's when you'll be able to uh, go do a deal with it. Okay, next question coming from Kathy Meadows, general question. Hi guys, and thanks for taking your time to help us all. I have a question about DealPro. Could you please show us an example to purchase then lease option? Thanks. Yeah, so um, let me show you. I'm gonna switch screens real quick. Um, can you enable me? I think I can. Because I, I, I want to show you, and instead of just talking about it, obviously, you, this is a very visual piece that you need to see. Um, so I'd, I'd like to get into REI Pro, go to Deal Pro, and this is where we're going to analyze every, almost every kind of scenario. And you guys know me. Look, I'm not all about just you know one strategy. I want to work multiple strategies. I understand people need to start with one strategy, but at the end of the day, you need to learn all of them. And how do you analyze multiple different ways? And that's where Deal Pro. it took us forever to figure this out from a software point of view. Um, so let's see. Yes, I'm going to continue. And let me find my, there we go. All right, so you can see uh, Deal Pro. I'm assuming, Bo, good? Yes, we're good. Okay. So I've already gone through and plugged the numbers just, just for time's sake here. Um, anytime I run an analysis, save it so you can come back to it and, and, and really see it. Otherwise, you know, how does it work? Well, I'm going to plug in an address. I'm going to say, okay, how do I want to buy it? So I can wholesale it, purchase, lease option, or seller finance. And then once you select that, Tell me what, you, how do you want to get rid of it, right? So we talk about the exit strategy side of things. Here's what I love. Like you could sell or finance it and sell it, or you could sell or finance it and rent it, or you could sell or finance it and lease option it, or you could sell or finance it and sell or finance it. This calculator is going to give you multiple different ways to do it. And I've never seen anybody out there create something like this. So I love the different scenarios because you can analyze what would be a better, I would say profits. Let's just stick there. You know, if I did a seller finance sell versus a seller finance lease option, what, how do my numbers shake out in both of those scenarios? And you could, it really is going to help you learn how to acquire, but what is my exit strategy? So in this particular example, um, I believe that we're talking about a purchase lease option. So I went in and already filled out some of the numbers. So I'm not going to bore you to death with everything, but I do want to quickly go through this. So the after repaired value, basically we ran comps on the property. We gave, what would this property be worth in tip top shape? And that's what people say ARV. Estimated purchase price. What am I going to pay the seller to acquire this property? Okay, so obviously we go to step four, you can fill out the cash offer. And then what that offer is, I carry it over into Deal Pro, and that's what I need to buy it at. Too many times people use a calculator very similar to this. And what they do is they throw a number like if I bought it for this much, okay, I could profit that or if I bought it for that much, you really need to understand what can you buy it for first and then add that number into here. Um, repair costs, so we've gone through the property. I did a uh, repair analysis, 55,000. Hedge expense is nothing more than more a buffer in case my analysis for repairs was figured incorrectly. So I always like to do 10% of that 55s, okay? So that 5,500 would be there for a buffer. So, I'm going through, you have other costs and you could drag these down and get very precise. Um, I just plugged in some hard numbers here. Um, now, when we get to financing, now I'm using the example of cash just to keep this analysis simple for everyone. You can choose hard money, private money, or just a normal fixed arm loan. Okay, and there's multiple ways. You could do hard money and then 
as a second loan get private money for the difference. So you have to run through it so you can see it. Now my exit strategy is to lease option it. So I wanna go in and buy this property. I wanna fix up this property. And then instead of selling it, which you could, I chose to do a lease option on this. Now I know the ARV is 235, but if I'm gonna, I call it like financing for 12 months, I'm, I'm gonna charge you just a little bit more um, to have the freedom of really making payments before you have to buy it. I know I could probably get an $8,000 down payment or what we call option payment. Um, the monthly rent is going to be whatever the, the rent value is for this property, which in this case is $1,600. You can always scroll back up here. And we do, it's the only Zillow thing we carry into the software because I think they're, they're really good at the rent values. There's other places you could check as well. Monthly credits, I just kept zero. I don't want to confuse anyone. And I only want to go 12 months. I never put my buyer on anything longer than 12 months because otherwise it really wouldn't be considered a lease. A lot of times you see these people, they get they control the property and then they turn around and, and really do it longer than 12 months. If my buyer needs more than 12 months, then I will have that conversation with them. I could extend it. I could just say, sorry. I could restructure the terms for another 12 months. There's a lot of things and options you can do here. Now, when I go through the analysis, you'll see all these numbers here. You know, when I look at my total net profit of 55,000, I now have an analysis that if I bought this property and turned around and lease optioned it, here would be my potential profit on this deal. The great thing is, is now, Maybe if I bought it and sold it, I could do that analysis. I could do if I bought it, rent it, or bought it, seller finance. And then I can evaluate what is the best exit strategy for me. You know, some people say, hey, I just want to hold on to property. Some people say, hey, Chris, I need to get cashed out right away. And some people it's like, no, I could hang on to this property. I just want to make a lot more. And then you could go seller finance. So uh, gives you multiple different ways to analyze these deals. Um, it really does put the power in your fingertips here to understand what is the best exit strategy based on this, you know, acquisition strategy of buying it. So hopefully that helped. And uh, Bo, if you yeah. want to <clears throat> steal the PowerPoint and go hey, back. Steal it back. Well, that was actually a really good explanation. Now, we spent a long time actually building that thing, and it is so powerful. Yep. All right. Am I back on the... Yep. You're good. I got like three monitors here if everybody sees me looking here. So it's like I get lost on my screen here. Okay. Next question from Rachel. Is it better to buy new construction as a first-time homeowner build your own or rehab a property? Well, this is a personal question, really. Yep. Um, let me give you three positive or one positive for each one of these scenarios. And I think you might, it might answer your question. Um, so again, very personal. Now, if you look at new construction, you know, a home that's already built, no one's bought it, no one's lived in it before. I mean, you pretty ha you have a brand new house, right? Everything's cleaned. Everything's, you know, should be in working order. Um, everything's good. Now, if you build your own house, obviously you get to build it exactly how you want it, right? So you get to choose everything. You get to, you know, put the walls in where you want them, or I want, you know, this particular island in my kitchen or whatever it may be. You get to kind of pick and choose. And then the last part is, do you rehab a property? Um, depending on the situation, you might be able to save a little bit of money this way. Now, again, we got to get a, get a good deal from the owner in order to go rehab it. But again, you know, you get to pretty much put as much or as little into the rehab as you see fit. And um, again, you could paint the walls a certain way. You could maybe take down some walls. So you kind of can arrange the home how you see fit for you and your family. Um, so I don't know if there's one that's better than the other. 
I think, you know, if you can find the neighborhood or the area that you want to be in, I would start there and then start pricing out new construction homes versus I want to build a home versus I want to rehab a home. So sometimes you fall in love with that old house that's in a perfect location that you would end up rehabbing, right? So it's just so personal. I, it, so I, hopefully I gave you one positive for each one of these and maybe that will help you. Next question from Gene says, greetings to both of you. Hi, Gene. Uh, please, how do I import some leads into REI Pro or how do I link that list of leads inside of REI Pro in order to market? Thanks, Gene. Well, Gene, good question. What I thought I'd do is we'll just actually do this by example. I'm going to switch over to REI Pro. And if we go over into the marketing section, this is where we will build a list. We can either add properties from Lead Pro, which is running a search, say foreclosures or absentee owners vacant and so on. But if you have a list you want to import, all we need to do is come here. We can either set up a campaign and import the list, but just click this button here that says import leads. And when you do that, we're going to have a good video here on how explains how to do it. Uh, step one, we need to create or select a campaign. If you already have an existing campaign, just select it here. I'm going to click add new campaign and I'll just do uh, T3 here as an example. You can also categorize this if you know this is an absentee owner list you have, or maybe it's a vacant, just choose the campaign type, hit create campaign. Now step two is to select your file, okay? Um, wherever you got your file from, I know a lot of people get them from their realtors or some other source, the county, um, just click select file. It does need to be a comma delimited or a tab delimited text file. So I'm going to click on a comma, delim comma delimited file I have here. And it's going to read the file. And what you're going to see here below is a small preview of your file with all of the fields that you have. Now, our job here is we don't know exactly what fields you have depending on where you got your file but we need to map certain fields into rei pro to pull this in and the key fields to keep in mind is we need to know the property's address and we need to know the owner's mailing address if you're going to pull in a marketing campaign typically you're going to do some type of letters or postcards or uh, some type of bulk skip tracing and we need that basic information in order to do all those functions so um, this, you have a header right across the top that have drop down boxes for each column. And so in that drop down box has a list of fields in REI Pro. So we have like street number, street name, street address, and so on. What you want to do is look for what type of column do you have. So I have a column here that's the property street address. And I want to make sure it didn't confuse anybody because some list that you get will have the street address and the address line to all in one field, like 495 Hopkins Street, Southwest, it may even say unit 202. Okay, if you have that type of format, we just wanna pick the street address. But some uh, places you get lists from will have a street number, and this is where the 495 would be. Then they would have a street name. If you have a format like that, then you would pick the street number versus the street name and so on. So we try to cover both scenarios for you. In this case, I have street address. Just in case I have an address line too, I'm gonna to go ahead and pick that here. And I'm gonna keep doing this city. Uh, here's a property state. So I'm gonna look for, there's a state field. And I'm gonna fill out these fields, just associating your fields to our fields. Um, county, we don't need it. So do not import, which is the default. We got the owner's first name and last name and maybe a company, if this is a company owned property. Uh, we look through the fields here. We do have owner first name, owner last name, owner company name. And I'm just simply picking the fields that makes the most sense that match up. Owner street address. Again, this is a street address in full. Address line two. We're gonna have a city, state, and a zip. Now these are all the required fields. We could pull in some additional fields or we can just simply ignore them for this. And I always like to do a preview. So I'll do a preview just to make sure that all the columns that I picked, the data that you're gonna pull in is matching the header. Once you're satisfied with that, all you have to do is click import. 
and it'll say leads imported successfully. In this case, I had 100 leads. I'm gonna click go to campaigns. And now you will see the T3 campaign here of type vacant with the 100 leads that we just imported. So from here, now we can go take action, order postcards, skip trace, list made, and so on right inside of REI Pro. So hopefully that kind of showed you by example how to import these leads in REI Pro. All right, we'll switch back screens. Next question from David Saunders. Can you guys give us one challenge that you faced and how did you overcome it? Well, that's a, that's a good one because we all have challenges. And, you know, we saw this question come in. I told Chris, I said, you know, I've got a really good tip I wanted to give somebody because me and my wife both, especially when we were really getting into real estate, we ran into this challenge. And then when we're out talking to people in live events, our students, you know, they have these, not only these, what do I do next questions, but a lot of it comes down to the communication with the seller. They just simply don't know what to say and they're really scared and they're, you know, we, me and my wife are talking when it's like, but what if they ask us this question and that question? And our biggest fear was they were gonna ask us something that we really just didn't know the answer to. And more importantly, here I am trying to target a property that I'm very interested in and I don't want to want to screw up the deal. So I was talking to Heather and we we're like, you know what, let's just go maybe to the county or the next county over. It's not really in my investing footprint unless it's a home run deal. Let's just call a bunch of sellers or potential deals or vacant properties, anything. Let's just call and qualify the seller just like we would do with any other property deal. And if we screw it up, we screw it up, it's fine. We're gonna learn from it, but we really weren't interested in the property anyway. And what we found out was, you know, a lot of the questions that you ask, the seller or potential seller in this case, they're gonna answer it the same way or the questions that they have of you are in a lot of times the same questions. And so this really gave us a lot of practice to overcome that fear of, oh, what do I say? And, you know, the more you say it, the more you do it, that repetition, you just get really comfortable talking about it. So that's one of the tips that I wanted to give is really you just have to get out there and do it, number one. Uh, don't let fear get in the way of that. Number two, if you're worried about screwing up a deal, just call on properties that you're not necessarily interested in and just get that practice. Because I, I don't say practice makes perfect. I know that's the saying, but it definitely makes progress. So get out there, get over that one fear. That's my tip. Yeah, thanks. This is actually a good question. I don't know if we've ever had anybody ever ask us this question, but um, not like that anyway. No. So I had to actually really think hard on this one. And one of the challenges that I faced, I guess, when I got started was how in the world do you determine the cost of repairs? Like they never teach you how to do that in any book right? And there wasn't YouTube back then. So how do you actually calculate the cost of repair? So I decided I'm going to head down to Home Depot. And I, what I did is I categorized a home. So you have the bathroom, you have a kitchen, you have a living room, you have these different rooms inside of a home. And I said, okay, if I had to replace a bathroom, what items would I need? And then I would go price all of these things out at Home Depot. I wouldn't take the most expensive stuff. I wouldn't take the cheap, it's just kind of right there in the middle. And I started totaling everything up. So when I went to a property, I would say, okay, hey, that bathroom needs to be updated or it needs to be completely redone. I just put a check box, you know, I had a check box, put a check mark in the box that said, you know, complete this whole bathroom. And I had a total number. Um, so I'd keep doing this throughout the house. I literally would take, maybe 20 minutes to walk an entire property and, and come up with a number. Now it was a little exaggerated the number, but I thought that was good because the more my repairs were, the less my offer would be. So it kind of gave me some room um, to, to resell or assign that particular property. So that's how I learned how to calculate repairs. Like I had no idea when I got started, I don't think really people teach it all that much, but um, that was one of the challenges that uh, I wanted to share with you guys. Awesome tip there. All right. Next question from Michael on wholesaling. 
what is the best way to find wholesale deals? Well, I don't know if one way is the best, but I'm going to give you my top list. How's that? So, uh, Bo, if you go to the next slide there. Um, the very first thing that I like to do is driving the neighborhoods. So driving for properties that have for sale by owner sign, a for rent by owner sign, and potentially vacant properties, right? So a lot of times where, you know, a landlord is in between tenants. You just happen to drive by, you spotted the house out, you know, especially when you drive by and you have like couches and mattresses at the curb for trash. You know, those are properties that I'd want to pull up. What I really like about this way is you're really understanding from a visual point of view, the condition of the house, at least from the outside. Because we're really looking for situations to get a deep discount on the, on the price if we're wholesaling. So, but it teaches you about the market that you live in, the different neighborhoods, what things sell for, what things rent for. You get to really experience that just by simply driving around, writing down a few addresses, looking them up in REI Pro, and just, you learn from that. And you keep doing that over and over again, you're going to find a deal. I mean, it's just, it's just really a matter of time. Um, so that's number one way. Uh, number two is when you're driving around, ask postal workers, hey, do you know where the vacant properties are in this area? I'm a local investor just looking to buy. Think about the postal workers. They know where all the vacant houses are, right? So it's almost like they really know what's going on in the neighborhood. So I would ask them why you're out. Um, the next way, um, big way is going to be direct mail. I would say the majority of the deals that I've done um, have come through direct mail. Okay, so and I've changed it a million different ways and, and so forth. But at the end of the day, direct mail, either a postcard or a letter, um, is going to work. Call on the owner, you know, especially if you drive by for sale by owner, just call them. Don't, if you have the phone number already, why would you send them direct mail? Right. You know, especially if for sale by owner or for rent by owner, they're putting the phone number on there. So you do call them. Right. So, you know, the only time that I would send, uh, you know, a direct mail piece when I have the phone number is if I couldn't get a hold of the owner or they didn't answer, or they wouldn't call me back, then I would actually send direct mail. But other than that, I would be picking up the phone. It is the fastest, most direct way to contact the owners is by calling them. And then pay-per-click advertising, you know, um, getting out there, especially like a Google, you know, usually when people are, keep in mind situations, somebody that's in pre-foreclosure, somebody that's uh, in a divorce, whatever the situation is, do you know what most people do? They go to Google. You know, what's the law behind this? What's going to happen if my wife takes off and takes the kids? And uh, what am I doing with the property? Those are the types of keywords that I'd want to look for to draw people that are actually searching for those key terms. And keep in mind, situations is kind of what we're marketing, not necessarily the house or the neighborhood, the situation. And uh, we could, you know, generate traffic to a landing page or a website, have them fill out a form and we can contact them that way. So I would say these are probably some of my personal favorites. Again, there's a, there's a lot of other ways to do it. But if I were to just move and jump into a new city, this is exactly what I'd be doing starting off. And I already know that I could do deals just doing these things. Absolutely. Okay, so hopefully that gave you a few good tips, uh, at least what I think, you know, works, especially doing over 500 deals. Um, you you kind of know what works and what doesn't work. So, you know, this, these are five really good ways. Well, that was a really good explanation coming into this next question here from Toby. It's actually home marketing. And he wants to know, what is the ultimate business marketing plan? I do have a few types of marketing, but would like to see the overall picture. As I grow my business, I have already closed eight deals in the last three months, and I've netted just over 65000 
I want to use some of this money to build my business. Well, first, Toby, good job on the eight deals in the last three months. You looks like you're uh, well on your way. Now you have this $65,000 and you're asking yourself, kind of how do I level up and what do I do? So I thought I would share with you guys something we do in a live event. It's called the Real Estate Marketing Matrix Chart. Now, I could spend an entire day or even a weekend on really this whole entire chart alone. Um, so I wanted to explain just kind of briefly, let's just take a look at this chart. And I've divided this chart into two different sections. And it looks like a V here. And on the left, starting in the upper left corner, all the way down to your website in the center, that's what I talk about as um, offline marketing techniques. And on the right hand side are online marketing techniques. A lot of people try to say, oh, that's old school marketing versus new school marketing. That's really just not true. These marketing topics, techniques all work hand in hand. And if you really take a step back for a minute and think about any of these marketings, I don't care if it's the direct mail Chris was talking about or letters or PPC advertising, what is the goal of all of that marketing effort? And that goal is to get somebody to either give you a call or visit your website. In general, we have to talk to somebody. So we're wanting to get in contact with those people. So over here in some general marketing, some of these techniques, we have things like business cards. You know, it, it, it always amazes me, Chris, when we go out into a live event, how many people don't have a business card for their business. And it's one of the cheapest, really most effective things to have when you're out there doing events. So business cards, flyers, special reports, the three foot rule. People always say, what is the three foot rule? You know, when, when we were first getting into uh, investing, I always think everybody's a competitor of mine. And I don't wanna tell anybody what I'm actually doing. And that's really the feathers from the truth. You know, you need to tell everybody you're an investor. Here's what I do. Here's what I'm looking for. And you'll be amazed at how many people even seasoned investors that maybe don't have time right now to do a specific deal, they'll just sling the deal over to you, make a little commission. And that's, you know, that's just what wholesaling is all about. Yard signs, card magnets, and so on in general marketing. Then we have the direct mail marketing. And here we're talking about these postcards, these letters, these special box, uh, special reports, wow boxes. Each one of these have different strategies and techniques that I could uh, teach you guys. But by and large, look, postcards are one of the most effective uh, direct mail marketing strategies. I want to call it a strategy techniques. I know I use them. REI Pro use them because we just love postcards because, you know, people just sort their stuff right over the trash can and they don't have to open a postcard. It hits them right in the face. Then we have some mass media. As you get more and more money, you want to put it into radio ads, billboards, you know, host some seminars. We have one student that would actually do some stuff uh, with seminars for investors. Um, that turned out really well for him. But then on the, you know, these are the offline strategies, okay? Things we're doing that's not centered around what we do online. But if we go to the opposite side of this over here on the V, we start out with online marketing, okay? And this is all the things we're gonna do online to attract either visitors to our website. And that's typically what we're doing we're doing some type of keyword research, some type of email campaign, some type of paid advertising. Doesn't matter if you're doing it on the social media platforms like Facebook, uh, YouTube, or you're just doing it on uh, Google AdWords and the different search engines. But what we're doing there is we're buying some form of advertising over here. And the goal is to get them to click on the ad and drive them to your website. And on that website, we're gonna have landing pages uh, that. You really need to tie in your marketing of what, you know, if you're in these situations, really, if we're targeting pre-foreclosures, land them on your website that's in pre-foreclosures, have a form that they can fill out. They fill this form out. That puts them on a email list. Send them some emails about how you can help them out of pre-foreclosure and so on. So all these marketing techniques tie together. And then once they're on the website, once they fill out the form, you're going to get a notice of it then you're gonna be able to pick up the phone, call this potential seller or this potential buyer and help them in their situation. So this is just a little chart here. There's a lot of things you can do once you start making some money to invest. You don't have to do all of these at one time because it could get you know expensive, but as you make more and more money, I do suggest putting more of that into marketing just to drive more leads, to fill the sales funnel so that you have a continuous um, potential leads coming through. So hopefully that helps a little bit on that marketing. 
Yeah. And I want to just emphasize the business card real quick because it, it almost is like people are just like, oh, that's like really super old school stuff. You know, everyone's looking for the next new thing, right? Mm -hmm. A business card, which is when you go to a restaurant, and I know it's a little different for restaurants in a lot of places right now. You go to a restaurant, you leave a tip and you leave your business card because everybody's a potential prospect. It's something simple you can do. It's very inexpensive and it's going to get the message across. And I think that one of the hardest things is people don't want to tell anybody about what they do. And that's crazy because they maybe, oh, you're in that real estate stuff. Oh man, that's, that's just a big old scam, you know, type of thing. And I think maybe people are a little embarrassed. You need to just open your mouth and say, hey, here's what I do. And a business card is still today a great way to pass along information. Uh, major companies that, you know, I see come to my house and I mean, they always have a business card. Yep. And uh, it's still one of the basic marketing methods still used today. So I know everyone's... Uh, People love physical things. Do you do you realize, Bo, that, it, and I remember doing this at a live event, but people can actually remember everything for the rest of their life. There's two things that your brain has to do in order to remember something the rest of their life. When I ask people, it's like, hey, have you ever been in a car accident? And you'd see the hands go up. And I'd pick somebody and say, uh, do you, what color of the car were you in? It was white. Do you remember the color of the car that you got in an accident? It was red. Um, do you remember, you know, what day that was? You know, how old were you? And they just boom, boom, boom. And then I'll go, do you remember the first thing that I said this morning? They're like, yeah, uh, crickets. good morning. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny how our brain can remember so many things. So the two things that your brain has to have in order to remember it is number one, you have to have a physical image of it. And number two, it has to create action. And again, we go back to some of these offline from a postcard or, you know, a, um, a business card. These are physical things that have an image and somebody has to hold it. They're going to flip it over. They're creating action and it's going to help them remember you. Or have you ever, you know, just, you saw something, you're like, where have I seen that before? I know I've seen that mm -hmm. somewhere. I think the more you get that message out to people, you're going to get more business. I know it's something very simple to do. It's very inexpensive. And I would highly, re look, make your business card crazy. I don't care, but pass them out, give them to people. And, um, you know, it takes one deal, one deal to pay for your business cards for like 10 years right? Or, or your years. entire so, investing career. I mean, why would you not do it? And that's, it's, well, it's, it's just, you know what, it's say. just so personable, shaking your hand, look at somebody in the eye, exchanging that information is just, it's that action, but it's real personal versus, yeah, just send me a text with your information on it. You know, it, it's a timeless marketing piece that everybody should be using. Yep. Next question from Billy. Should I send direct mail marketing during the holiday season? Thanks for your help. Uh, well, absolutely. Um, and I'm going to give you the best reason why on the planet. Just because it's a holiday doesn't mean that <clears> the <throat> seller's situation has gotten any better. All right. Because just because it's Thanksgiving doesn't mean that they're still in a bind or their health is still bad or they're still behind in payments. And it's so funny. People stop doing direct mail and I'm like, you guys are crazy. Like you're no, actually, you're not crazy because it kind of eliminates competition for us, right? <laughs> so we're, you know, we'll do heavy direct mail marketing. My students will do heavy direct mail marketing during these times. And I can tell you, some of my students have done some of the biggest deals during this time. One of my big deals that I did, I did, ready for this? And I didn't even know what I was doing because I knew when I got started, my income only stops when I stop right? It's like a doctor, right? So I had to go out and flip a house. Otherwise my paycheck, there was none, right? So I was self-unemployed again until I'd find that next deal. So for me, 
I had to do this 365 days. There was no, hey, oh, I'm, you know, I'm going to respect people's time and, you know, it's Thanksgiving and I'm not going to send them anything. That's crazy. These people that you're marketing are the people that are in trouble. They need your help. That's almost like the best time of the year to market people. Okay. So just remember that people's situation does not change because it's a holiday. And, uh, but one of the big deals I did is I put three houses, I think it was three vacant lots, 12 duplexes and one apartment complex on one contract. It was owned, all of it was owned by one owner. And I did that deal in the middle of December and sold it the last day of December. That was, that was a good new year's present, uh, by the way. So, <laughs> so yes, absolutely. You should be doing direct mail marketing. You should always be marketing. That never should come to a halt ever. Look, the old sales rule set, you know, you have to keep filling the funnel so that you've got a set steady stream of sales coming in. Yep. I believe that was the last mail-in question. I see here a, <clears throat> looks like, yeah. how can they get a free copy for those? Yeah, those that have not already downloaded it, you can go to Chris Goff Real Estate. You can see the book. Um, we don't sell anything on there. Actually, coaching is shut down. You know, I, I don't even sell a home study course outside of a wholesaling course. Um, so this isn't a, a, a pitch fest as a lot of people you know, would probably draw the conclusion to, and I want to just remind everybody that's on this call, these are questions that are being submitted by our REI Pro users. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take your questions, if you're an REI Pro subscriber or not, because we did invite some people that aren't necessarily on REI Pro. So just keep that in mind. These are questions submitted by our users, and um, we do this almost every week. Uh, just for our users, um, and very rare we'd open it up to the the public, which we did in this particular case. Yes. All right. So if you, I see some questions over in the chat window. I'll do my best to try to filter through those. Um, but if you do have a question, please put it in the Q and A panel. Um, that's where most all of this I can just keep organized. So, yep. very first question coming in from Brad. Other than determining ARV, what ways do you use comparable sales data? For example, from the buyer side, do you share comps with sellers to justify your offer? From the sales side, do you share comps with potential buyers? Is there a way to use REI Pro to see price trends in selected areas? And what are the cool stuff can we do with this data that we have available to us? Yes. So there are times I will show this to the seller. The only time I would ever show it to a buyer is if wholesaling is a great example. If I'm going to sign the contract, I want to show my investor, hey, the ARV is this number. That's why this is a good deal and you need to take it over. Um, but just like generally like lease options, things of that nature, I don't, or even a, just a, a you know, fix and flip. I don't necessarily show comps uh, to my buyers. I, I will work with sellers. You know, those sellers that are just very difficult that, hey, no, 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 my house is worth this much. No, Johnny's house down the street sold for this. And mine is a little bit nicer than theirs. So we <laughs> should get this much. Sometimes you have to educate the seller and I'll use that uh, comp. Uh, to help my argument, I guess you'd say, right? So um, definitely seller would be very rare for a buyer unless it was like an investor situation. As far as the data, what can you do with it? We're working on multiple ideas right now um, with that concept. Now we do give you the estimated values through an area on each house. Um, once you go to a property, you can pull that map up and move it around and really see the values of the different properties. But we're working on some more analytical pieces um, for you that's, you know, just oh, this good awareness, um, you know, for people that are very analytical and they love to see numbers and trends and things of that nature. So I know we are working on some of those pieces as far as, um, you know, the data side of it. Yep. Uh, question from Tim. I'm not sure I understand 
the overall question, but how come when I save a property into REI Pro, the photo doesn't follow the, I guess it's didn't follow the address. Um, if you want to clarify, Tim, I'm going to take a stab at it just to, I think maybe. Um, well, that was that change also, yeah, Bo, that That's Google what I'm thinking. Made. Yeah, there was, a, we used well, to have that property. Yeah. I, that, we hated that, guys. Basically, when you save a property, you could take, you know, we'd show you the street view and you could just set that as a main photo. And um, unfortunately, Google has now changed the rules. And yeah, we can't uh, store their image. They do not allow you to store their image behind a login. Now, from a public point of view, people take screenshots all the time of Google Maps or houses and stuff like that. But they have made, and this isn't an REI Pro change. This is a Google change for all companies, no well, matter what and, company you are. And the reason, and the reason they do it is because they're they're a machine that can just turn dollars. And every time that Street yep. View comes up for people like us, they like to charge us for it. So that is correct. They don't want us saving that off anywhere against their terms. Yeah, every time you guys pull that map view up, we have to pay Google to display it everywhere. Every and time. then they said, well, we're going to charge you, but we're still not going to allow you to take the, the photo and save it. <laughs> so, so hopefully I that's, think that's what, what he's talking what he's about. At. If not, throw it back out there. Okay. Al says, hi, I have used REI Pro to do a postcard campaign last week. I mailed 192 postcards. Today I get a call from a seller and he caught me off guard. He would not tell me what he is asking. He said, give me an offer. He has tenants paying $1,850 a month, and Zillow says $350,000. What would be your next step? I'd want to see it if you can get in with tenants in it. <clears throat> because, you know, I tell people all the time is I really want to physically see it. Um, I hate making – anybody can make an offer without seeing it, and then it be contingent on actually seeing it right? But I need to really, every time I make an offer, I always put my best offer front. I don't give them, okay, if they don't take this, then I'll move up a little bit. I give them an offer, you know, analyze the conversation, how the conversation go, what does the property look like? And then I will put together our best offer or offers on the property. I always look at making an offer. It's just something that, you know, just experience here, but I try to look at every single angle that the seller could come back and say, yeah, but I can't accept that amount or, oh, that number is just a little bit too low. Well, that's why I wanted to give you my lease option offer where I could actually pay you more. So I'm always looking at the different angles. So when I shoot these offers over to the owner, it's going to be hard to argue why we're offering this. Now, again, I need to explain it. I need to do my job doing that part, but I'm going to make it to where you can't argue with me. And if you're going to argue with me over the numbers after I explain it, they're just not motivated, you know, so move on. Yep. All right. Question from Lynn. When wholesaling a pre-foreclosure, that you have under contract, at what point do you bring the seller's mortgage up to date? Do we need to wait till closing or does that happen at closing? So if you're wholesaling the pre-foreclosure, that back payment amount has to be paid before the auction date. So let that be <clears throat> kind of your guide. Now we don't wanna wait till the day before, right? So. Our job is to hurry up and get that particular investor that you're going to wholesale the deal to, to make up that back payment because we need to stop this process. So once the loans brought current, the foreclosure process comes to an end. Okay. Cause now the loan is current. So we want to do that as quickly as we possibly can, but just keep in mind, it has to be before the auction date. Okay. Let's see. We may have answered this through one of the um, slides, but they may have asked this question before you got to it. I'll make sure. Kim says, can you discuss your analysis of each step? What specifically are you looking at or for on each? What is your thought process and what red flags or home runs do you look for? 
Oh, that would take a while <laughs> from a teaching point of view. Let me yeah. just say that. So um, I, I say that might be, um, how about if we do that on the next training? Let's actually analyze um, a deal that's going on right now. How's that sound? Uh, because, and then that, it's so much easier, like a real deal, instead of just hypothetically saying, you know, you know, talking about this or that. Um, maybe if we go through like a real deal that's being worked right now, you know how we did the deal analysis stuff. And yeah. then let me go through the 10 steps and say, okay, here's what I pay attention to. Okay, here's what's important for me to see. Here are the things that aren't really important right now until I talk to the owner about this. <laughs> you know, so it's a lot easier to explain all that stuff when we have a real property in the middle of it. Because, um, you know, it seems like every situation is a little bit different. Although it's a seller selling a house. It, it, there's always a situation behind it. And I have to evaluate that situation to help me understand what numbers or what things do I look at in REI Pro that may be a little more valuable in this particular deal than maybe just a normal deal. So mm -hmm. uh, maybe we'll do that um, on the next training. Question coming in from James. I'm looking to use OPM, I assume other people's money for deal buying multiple properties. Have you tried or suggest setting up a syndication? Can we give debt positions in a syndication? Can you repeat it? I'm looking to use other people's money for deal buying multiple properties or for buying multiple properties. Have you tried or suggest setting up a syndication? Can we give debt positions in a syndication? I never use other people's money that way. Um, yeah. I'm very old school on how to use other people's money. And I like to keep it very simple when I do these things, but every situation to me is a little bit different. Like one of my students went out that you actually mentioned Bo that did a seminar mm -hmm. and um, I helped him with the presentation and he brought in $3 million total, $3 million to be used in real estate. Well, part of that is going to buy a short-term deal, which may need to be moved into its own business entity for that particular example, um, where maybe I have some investors that really are kind of looking for the long-term gains, but they want to use, you know, property as the collateral um, from it in case, you know, you disappear and you don't want to pay the investor. There's just so many different scenarios when it comes to borrowing money. The one thing that, let me just tell you, you can't do, because I'm thinking about it, is you can't advertise out there that you're looking for investors to fund real estate deals and I will pay 10% interest. You can't actually market that. So I wanted to throw that out there real quick because I'm thinking of it. But there's just so many, I like to work with one investor at a time type of thing versus multiple um, in, in like a big pot. And that's really what a hard money lender does. Is they take all this money from different investors and they have certain criteria that they follow. And here's what we do. I like to almost individualize it. I might borrow 50 grand over here from, you know, Jane. And then I've got 200 grand over here from Bob. Those are going to be probably structured in different ways on how um, they get paid, uh, what type of properties that they're more interested in. Um, is this, um, am I borrowing the money for a very short period of time because they want it all back? Am I, do I have to hold the property as collateral for, there's a lot of different scenarios when borrowing for, uh, money. If you've never done it before, I would highly recommend getting with a coach or a mentor, um, to really help walk you through that whole setup process when you're borrowing money. Mm -hmm. It's not difficult. Okay. To do. It's just, it seems like they're all unique. And I, you know, it's easy to say, hey, I'm gonna pay this much, 10%, you know, and here's how we do it. But not every investor is going to agree with that. So, you know, let's move on. Question, Susan, could you elaborate a little on how to wholesale a pre-foreclosure? Well, you are literally doing everything as if you were working the pre-foreclosure deal in itself. I'm going to look at the property. I'm going to do an inspection analysis. 
I'm going to get the payoff statement um, from the owner. I'm going to get the reinstatement, which is the back payment amount from the owner. I'm going to understand you're going to gather all the information. Then we're going to determine, okay, what is the total debt on this property? So if the house is worth 300, they have a loan on it for, let's say 150, just to keep the number simple. They owe 20,000 in back payment. It's going to cost 30,000 to fix up. So there's another 50. So now I've got 200 in it. And I'm adding those numbers up to say, okay, I want to wholesale this because I know this is a really good deal for another investor to take over. And it's actually super smart for any investor to take over these types of deals because you think about this, if I only have to come up with 20,000 for the back payment, 30,000 for repairs to put the house back on the market, I only have $50,000 invested into this deal right? Because the other 150 is the original loan that's going to stay in place until you sell the property. Once you sell it to the new buyer, that loan would then get paid off. So I'm literally passing a good deal, a super good deal over to an investor that doesn't have to put as much money on the table versus if they paid all cash for properties versus if they had to put 20% down plus the cost of repairs, it can add up. So, um, you're doing the exact same thing as if you were going to do the deal yourself as far as gathering all the information, putting that under contract, and then finding an investor <clears throat> to take over that four fee. Next question. Do you suggest waiting until Q1 to purchase, buy, and hold rentals? Some mortgage forbearances will end then, so we may see more inventory. Man. Yeah. Um, well, it's all about the numbers. If it's a good deal that you run across, do I wait now just because there's going to be more inventory? Well, you know, I'm not a big rental guy to begin with. Um, just because I think it's probably one of the least profitable strategies that we do. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's there for that long-term investment side. If you, like Bo said, if you run into a good deal now, you know, the numbers have to make sense, no matter if it's today or the first quarter um, of next year. So people are, you know, always look at people are more in trouble today than they probably will be three to six months down the road, just depending on the whole COVID thing, right? And it's very hard to predict that. It's hard to predict, yeah, there's going to be a lot of inventory. A lot of big investors may come into the game and start buying these up in bulk. I don't know if that's going to necessarily help the, you know, the just Joe, the investor that buys four houses a year. Um, so I think you'll have a little bit more competition, but again, the numbers have to make sense and it doesn't matter when that is today, or, I mean, I, I, if I want to make money today, I go do it today. If, if you want to wait, you know, you might be missing out on a lot of things. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, Kim wants to know, how does the beginner figure out repair costs quickly? Do we need to bring a GC to the initial meeting? How do you know it's an ac if even it's an accurate number? Well, you don't. Um, that's the thing. So, But if you go to step three um, in the software, we actually have a couple of free resources to click on. And um, they do an evaluation of what things cost in very specific areas of the country. So you can get pretty fine-tuned. You know, how much would it cost to replace a roof? You know, well, what kind of roof? Well, this kind of roof, you know? So um, they give you some really good numbers to kind of help. I always <clears throat> like having a contractor if you can, um, because that's going to speed up the learning curve. Um, not that every contractor's, you know, 100% on it. It's going to be close enough. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not the guy that goes in and says, you know, that cost of repairs is down to this penny. All right. I mean, we're, I'm going to over exaggerate the cost just to create buffer. And then in the cash offer formula, we're going to add another hedge cost to that to buffer that. So you don't have to be perfect, but I do like taking contractors and you can definitely check out those free resources. Question from Sean. Thank you guys. I have a quick question for both of you. I had a goal this year to make more than a hundred thousand. I have made over 200,000. And I know that I am self-sabotaging myself. I haven't done a deal in three months. What are your thoughts? I have people, I know people have previously hit this wall 
when they have, quote, achieved their goals, but I want to break through this wall. Thank you for your help ahead of time. Your app is amazing. Well, good job on doubling what your goal was at number one. Um, I would say that, you know, I don't know if you are just sitting around as far as not doing the deal. Maybe you're comfortable you hit that number. Uh, Chris, I think something similar happened to you. You ran out of that money at 200000 would evaporate and then there's nothing going to be more motivating than all of a sudden that money disappeared. Yeah. I so. made 96,000 my first year and I didn't know what I was doing. And when I made 96,000, I thought I was rich. Like, <laughs> man, I made almost a hundred grand, you know, when I got started, I'm like thinking today, I don't even know how people make it <clears throat> making less than a hundred grand, especially if you have a family, like, that is hard to do. It's hard to get by. So when you double that particular goal, I got into really, you know, that I don't want to do anything. I'm going to go play golf more. I bought a BMW uh, M3 when I was 26. I paid cash for it. And there was that moment of time I, I ran out of money. And I was so stressed out because, you know, you still have your basic bills to pay you know, your house, utilities, things of that nature. And I stressed out so much that I woke up one morning, I was like five in the morning. I said, I'm going to go find deals. I, I got to go back to what I did to get that money and just duplicating that same thing. And I think it's when you take it for granted is when things fall apart. You know, you're not as focused anymore. It's almost like, all right, been there, done that, now what? Okay. And that's where you have to challenge yourself to set new goals. I literally hate putting a dollar amount as a goal, personally. Um, because I, dollar amount is, you could run into one deal and hit that goal in this business. You, you might need to do 10 deals before you hit that dollar amount. I was the kind of person that said, I wonder how many houses I can flip. How many houses can I do? And that's where, you know, when I did, you know, 46, my first year, not knowing what I was doing, I was just passing them on real cheap. Like, give me a few grand. I'm good, you know, type of thing. Now, you know, knowing a lot more now, I wouldn't have let those deals, you know, go for so cheap. But my goal was, how many houses can I do? You know, it's like setting a to-do list. I always write a to-do list in the evening time and I write down, okay, here are the things that I need to get done. And what I do is I, I write more stuff down than I think that I could do. And then when I wake up, it's, it's not just paying 100% attention to everything. It was just like, no, 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 I got to cross that off. No, I got to get that done, get that done, get that done. No, I got to move on to the next thing, get that done. And what you do is you start to train your mind that you just go, you go, you don't stop, you go. And when you, when you do stop, you feel that you're behind. And when you feel like you're behind, oh my God, I gotta go. You know, so it repeats that cycle. I think when you, we get in that habit of, okay, I hit my goal, you know, I haven't done a deal in a few months, I'm probably not putting much effort into it, or I'm just a little relaxed because I have some cash, there's that comfort zone. You know, I think you might want to redefine what your goals are. Is it a dollar amount or is it something else? You know, I was the kind of guys, look, I just want to build this as big as I could possibly do it. And like, I love going into the office and seeing that we I had 18 houses under contract. You know, next week, we'll, well, heck, we only got six houses under contract. What are we doing? We got to get out there. You know, so it was always the number of deals, not necessarily a dollar amount, because the dollar amount will take care of itself at the end of the day, if you're doing deals. That was a long answer. <laughs> I think you're on mute, Bo. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I said, that's okay. It gave me a chance to communicate and type with some people over here. Oh, there you go. Um, Larry, what company do you use to email contracts? I've used several, Larry. You can Google them. They're a dime or a dozen, seems like, these days. Um, I used HelloSign because, you know, you can get a certain number of them free uh, per month. And then, of course, you got DocuSign. And just go out there and Google. Any one of those are, you know, good. Yep. 
Uh, Tim, one more question. Is it customary or necessary to get into a contract with a real estate agent when you're looking at properties uh, researching engines like Zillow or Redfin? Uh, is the question, is it a good idea it, to put houses under contract with a real Well, owner? is it customary or necessary to get into contract with an RE agent when you're looking at properties that you find on Zillow or Redfin? So I'm not sure if he's saying, do I need to get under contract, say as a buyer, you let them be my buyer's agent yeah. so they can go out there and represent me? I don't know if that's the question. Uh, you know, or do I have to go through a realtor just to even talk to these people? Yeah, I, I don't personally like doing that. And a lot of realtors today, um, won't sign anything with you in the beginning. I know they want to because they want to represent you and anything that I show you, you know, I'm owed a commission type of thing on. Um, I have met with a lot of realtors and I've had a lot of them say, hey, you know, we need to, um, you know, be your buyer's agent. We need to fill out this piece of paper. And I'm like, look, you know, I'm not going to sign it because I just met you. I kind of look at it as like a first date. You get to know me. I get to know you. And if the relationship pans out, then I'll sign your document. But just keep in mind, I work with a lot of realtors. And um, so I, I'm not a big fan of doing it that way because what happens if they drop the ball? You know, it's like, I, 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 there's no, I, I don't want to contract with somebody. You know, just, you know, obviously I know why they do it to help protect them. Um, but uh, I'm not a big fan of that. So, um, is that it? <laughs> no, just a couple more. Um, okay. Let's see here. Is there is there a good season to send pre foreclosure postcards because of COVID nineteen? And what about sending text? I live in Florida. Well, you know, I think we've had this question really over the last several weeks about sending marketing to pre foreclosures and. You know, probably because of the moratorium and all that stuff. I mean, I, you know, Amos asked this question. It's now, last week, next week, last month. There, there all is the time. a good season. <laughs> you know. Yeah, there is a good season for pre foreclosures, and it is the pre foreclosure season, um, which happens every day. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, "You're going to throw me a curveball here," because you know. But as far as sending text, uh, Amos, that's a. Another topic we do talk about on here, you got to be careful. It's illegal to send people text messages without pre-approval. I'm going to leave it at that. You know, as far as that, go research Telephone Consumer Protection Act. Yep. Veronica, hey, guys, I'm going to look at a house tomorrow. It is in pre-foreclosure. It goes to auction February the 20th, 2021. She owes 66000 on the house. I offered her 70000 without looking at the house. What documents do I need? And when I pay off the loan, isn't the house still in her name? Um, so the, the two most important documents you need is the payoff statement from the bank. Don't take the owner's word on this, okay? And then the reinstatement letter, which you'll hear a lot of times, I'll call it back payments, whatever that number is. So if you go in and don't get me wrong, you can go in and just buy the house from the owner and be done with it. It goes out of their name, the loan gets paid off, and you just bought a house. You know, the other way that I teach it is to go in and sell or finance it. Get them to deed you the house without paying off the loan. That'll give me time to fix up the property, put it back on the market, and then resell it. And at that point, their loan would be paid off. So, but those are going to be the two. I would highly recommend going through the pre-foreclosure training series. Uh, if you click the education tab in the software, um, we go through the entire process um, of the whole business. So I, I would recommend going through that. Um, Antoine, can you guys please explain a subject to? A subject to is a sentence. Keep in mind, it, it's a sentence that says subject to existing financing. So anytime you sell or finance, a property where the owner is going to finance it, okay, and there's an existing mortgage on it. It's basically a disclosure that says subject to existing financing, meaning that if I stop paying on the original financing, I'm sorry. I, I just couldn't do it. It's kind of your escape from actually 
forcing you to pay on the existing mortgage. Now, of course, if we've got money into this deal, I don't want to lose the deal by not paying uh, the loan. So, um, but that's all it is. People like to, you know, use it as a seller finance strategy. It's not even a strategy. Like it's on every HUD settlement statement at any closing. Um, there's a box there. Is this subject to existing financing? So hmm. that's all it is. And this is probably more of just a comment, but please, like, please, guys, can you be my coaches and my hard money lenders as well? Thanks. Now I'm starting to have a clue of this business is all about. Thanks. Oh. Yeah, from the coaching side, you can email us at coaching at myreipro.com um, to learn more about coaching. I do take a few people at a time from a from a coaching standpoint. As far as the loaning of money, we don't do that. Um, it's like loaning your family member money. It's just, we just don't want to be in the middle of that. Now we could teach you how to go find the money. <laughs> so just like my student that, uh, you know, did a seminar and brought in $3 million, he used my credibility to help back him up because I was instructing him on what to do as far as the real estate side. So, um, when people saw, Hey, Chris Goff, he's a, best-selling author. He's been on ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, and all over the planet. It built a lot of credibility for my students. And we built this presentation to attract the money. So from a coach point of view, I'd rather teach you how to go do that versus us giving you the money to go do it. Lynn, did you ever use your basic purchase agreement in the state of New Jersey or Pennsylvania? You mentioned You've used it in about 17 states. Uh, me personally, no for both of those states, but I do know people, yes, that have because I have students there in both of those states. And we, um, Chris Good, that first first guy that comes to mind, you know, did uh, his first four deals. We used that one page contract. I saw we did one of the houses we bought. I mean, we used a one page contract, so. You know, it has all the basics you need in it without going too crazy. But, I, you know, obviously wouldn't recommend it for every situation, um, but it's going to handle. I don't know of a state where it's not good. Let me say it that way. Well, think about what the definition of a contract is. It's nothing more than what two people will agree upon. It could be written on the back of a napkin. You just got to have the right language to protect you in the deal. So, um, yeah. There's, there's, there's some components to a real estate contract that are mandatory in order to execute the contract. You know, like consideration is one of them. Mm -hmm. You know, is there a deposit? Um, what is that amount or earnest money? Um, there, there are pieces that have to be disclosed and we try to keep that at a bare minimum um, in our one page contract, so. Uh, Kim, great info, guys. You are so real and down to earth. Really appreciate your time. Enjoy listening to your wisdom. Thank you. And when is the next training? And then in parentheses on analyzing, on analyzing a real deal. Yeah, we could actually do that on our next training. We now, we, we did this again on Tuesday. Um, you know, for those that come every single time we do this, so normally do it on Thursday. Next week is Thanksgiving. So number one, I want to just say happy Thanksgiving to you guys if I don't talk to you. Um, so we will postpone next week. We'll move it into the following week. Um, we'll do it Tuesday or Thursday. We haven't really, uh, or did we? Yeah, I think we, we just went ahead and said we're going to do it right? December 3rd, which is a Thursday. We just had some extenuating other things we had to deal with the last couple of weeks is why it's been on Tuesday. Yeah. And uh, that would be a great time for us to really go through a deal um, and really kind of analyze that one deal. What do I really look at? What, how do we run the comps? Really going through the 10 executable steps. Um, so maybe, you know, we'll call it the 10 executable steps to closing a deal or something uh, for the next Q&A. Yeah, and really just break it down. Yeah. All right, last one that I see here from Yvonne. What area would you suggest for a brand new investor, i.e. pre-foreclosures, absentee owners, et cetera, who has to start with wholesaling until they create enough revenue to start doing other types of deals? Like what categories are best to look at for the best in wholesaling? 
Thanks in advance, guys. I love your way of teaching. Well, number one is I always say, start in your backyard, you know? Um, but in what I say backyard, it's where are you willing to drive, right? So, and then what I want to do is take the middle price point areas or neighborhoods. So not the top of the line, not the war zone. Take that middle price market and just a little bit below. And that's going to really be your ideal marketplace for wholesaling. Perfect. And that could be anywhere, you know, unless you're in Manhattan or something, right? I mean, you got to look at where you can drive, but you also have to find those types of neighborhoods too. Well, that right wraps it up. And uh, like Chris said, you guys have an awesome Thanksgiving next week. We will get a schedule for December the 3rd. Chris, are we going to do uh, uh, any questions on that? Are we doing just one deal analysis and really break it down? Um, I think it would be probably more educational to take our time on one because there's a lot of components to that. And then we can take questions that follow up that particular education. I think when we try to squeeze in too many deals, I think it's good, but I think it may just over some people's head. So I think it's probably better to maybe take our time on one and just start from the beginning. And then let's walk through the process and actually understand how do we connect these dots? What are we looking at? How do we do it? When do we do it? Why in the heck are we even doing it? And I think that might be more educational. Gotcha. All right. Well, perfect. Uh, and we'll send out happy Thanksgiving <clears throat> stuff um, to you guys next week, but it feels like we're talking to you here. So instead of an email, um, so uh have a safe week uh, this week. I'm actually flying to Nashville tomorrow and uh, I have to pick up my wife. For a lot of you that followed me, she had a major surgery done in Nashville at Vanderbilt and um, I'm going to pick her up, be back Friday. Um, so have a wonderful, safe week and uh, Thanksgiving and we'll talk on the next one.